In the United States, in each of our states, the uh, largest uh, mental facility are jails, unfortunately. Um, there are more people in jails who have mental health issues than are actually in actual facilities meant to house individuals who have mental illness. And one of the things that the judiciary is really good at is convening people together in a way to really try to come up with solutions to that. I was on a panel that really focused on children with mental illnesses as a juvenile court judge, uh, particularly those um, in our underprivileged neighborhoods, um, our black and brown youth is particularly, and how we can make a difference in their lives. It is super important for us to reach the children before they enter the system. What There are so many studies that talk about once a child enters into the system, then there's more likelihood that they're going to stay in the system. And we don't want that. I am hoping to be able to replicate what we are doing at this summit, and we've already begun discussing that. We've already begun uh, brainstorming who can be at the table. I know the Virgin Isles, they brought a large contingent, including the Attorney General, uh, legislators. Um, those are the types of folks that we would like to get at the table in South Carolina and the summit tells us it's possible. You know, the National Center for State Courts and the Conference of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators really recognize this as an issue of national importance to the judicial branch and so really brought together the leaders uh, from all of those organizations to really think about how can we best address this. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm excited about the information that I've learned and ready to go back as our team um, to make better plans for how we deal with mental illnesses within the court system. I truly believe that in about 10 years we're going to look back and first shake our heads at how do we ever treat people this horribly, but equally, if not more importantly, we'll have looked back and said, wow, we really fixed a big problem. And I think this is the beginning of seeing that happen. There was a lot of interesting excitement around ways to deal with these issues, and that is the work of the National uh, Mental Health Task Force that you're going to hear more about today, is to really inspire all of you and others in the court system as leaders to really begin to think about how we can address these very complicated issues. Uh, if, you, if you can pull up the slides, that would be helpful. Um, so let me just start by talking a little bit about kind of um, where, where we are and how we got to this part, this point. Um, and as you heard in the, in the video, the mental health crisis is exactly that. It's a national crisis. Um, we see uh, an overrepresentation of individuals with mental illness in the justice system. And as I said in the video, um, jails are the number one psychiatric institutions in the United States, despite the fact that, of course, they're not meant for that. Um, and so you wonder, how did we get to this point? Is it just all of a sudden uh, we have more mental illness or is, you know, where, where did, how did we get here? And it really, if you, if you go back and look at, at the history, part of the reason why we got here at least is that there was an effort in the 1960s to really try to get individuals out of psychiatric institutions. There was a concern that we were over-institutionalizing individuals with mental illness and so there was, a national, there was national legislation passed called the Community Mental Health Act of 1963. And what that, what that legislation did at the federal level was to provide a financial incentive to states to close state psychiatric hospitals and transition to community mental health, which we would all probably applaud as a good effort. Unfortunately, the promise of community mental health never really materialized. And so we closed facilities and in places where people could, be, could receive treatment and said we would do it in the community and then never provided the option uh, that was supposed to be there. So instead, by default, um, in many of our states and local jurisdictions, individuals transitioned out of those facilities and since then instead into the justice system. So just a couple of stats. Um, there are two million individuals um, with serious mental illness that spend time in our jails. Um, and, that, and there's an estimated today, an estimated 383,000 people with serious mental illness in our jails uh, versus 40,000 in state-funded hospitals. So there you see really the impact that we're having uh, with individuals uh, being in our justice system. Um, there's a statistic that says that somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of all people with serious mental illness have either been in jail or prison at least once. And so you see the individuals um, cycling through our system multiple times. 
But it's not just our prisons and jails where courts interact with individuals with mental illness. Consider, for instance, the traffic or housing court, where it's actually more likely that individuals with mental illness will come into contact with the courts and have probably their most often interactions. And so many times we focus our efforts on the more serious felonies and misdemeanors or jails and prisons, but I think it's worth thinking about where those individuals have their first contact with the courts. Also, it's not just criminal and it's not just sort of infractions and issues that come up. We see individuals with mental illness in all parts of our court system. Um, that might also be in the child welfare system. Um, I'm sure you'll hear some more about that today, but individuals interacting with the court system and through the child welfare system, even divorce court, um, juvenile delinquency, you've heard a little bit about that uh, in the video this morning, but we know that individuals um, with mental illness oftentimes have their first onset um, in their early teenage years. And so we're beginning to see, have been seeing that and beginning to see it. Uh, but it's also not even just those courts. It's even in the civil courts where we'll see those things come up. So no matter what your docket is, um, we believe that there's efforts that you can take to begin to address these issues. Another thing that we know is that there are a lack of treatment options. There's a lack of appropriate medications in jails, and there's delays of getting people into treatment. So all of these are challenges that the National Task Force was looking at. And so in March of 2020, the Conference of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators appointed the National Judicial Task Force to examine state courts' response to mental illness, held the record for the longest national task force name. Uh, we, we will call it today the Mental Health Task Force, just for ease. Um, and that task force has been working diligently for the past two years plus to really come up with really practical solutions that court leaders across the country can take uh, and, and use to implement to re begin to make a difference. And so you'll hear a lot about that. But it's not just CCJ and Costco that have been looking at this issue. Uh, as you know, NACOM just released this week its behavioral health guide. And I know many of you were in the education session yesterday where you heard more about that, but certainly we would commend that to you as something worth using. So today we're gonna be talking about some of the tools, practices, resources that have been developed and the ongoing work of the National Task Force and the key takeaways. So um, our goal today will be to focus on trial courts uh, and we're gonna start by uh, having some brief introductions uh, by our panel and I'll turn first to Justice uh, Chris Goff uh, from the um, Indiana Supreme Court. Well, thank you, David, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us at an early session. I, I, I always hope that when uh, you know, I speak on a panel like this that the message is something that can be helpful and, and I, I, I think and I believe that this message will be helpful to you as you go about your work. Um, I, I serve as an associate justice on the Indiana Supreme Court. I've been in that position for five years. Uh, I started my career, however, uh, primarily as a public defender. I was a general practitioner, but that's what usually came in the door uh, in my small county seat law office in rural Indiana. And uh, after eight years of practice, I became a, a trial court judge in, in rural Indiana uh, in a county so small that there are only two judges and our kids married each other. And uh, it's a true story. Uh, but it was a, a resource desert, a legal desert. And um, many of the principles that the task force uh, is encouraging folks to employ in their courts were some of the same principles that we found w were necessary to um, sustain public safety, but really to improve community well-being in, in a community uh, like the one I, I lived in. So look forward to discussing uh, this important work with you today. Second on the panel, we have Walter Thompson, who's a peer support specialist from Miami-Dade County. So, Walter? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm Walter Thompson. I'm the peer support specialist for the uh, 11th Circuit Court. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, task force and because uh, it affects my community. It affects everything that I do and everything I see because we always wanted that help in our communities, and I finally found something that, that can help my community. Like I said, it's, I'm a peer support specialist, and all the stuff that, I, that I've seen is happening, I know it works because it worked for me. And as, a, as a, getting that support that I had, I was able to come back to this society here in the, as the United States. I was able to come back because I'm retired United States Army, and all I knew was Army, and that's all I knew, and I went from there. And I know a lot of people can say, well, he was, he was living a good life, but that's all I knew. And it didn't really fit inside 
uh, coming back to uh, just being a normal citizen. And so I got that support and I got everything there from my, my, from my VA and, and I seen all the programs that I got and they put me in it and I wanted to be a part of it. And so I met uh, Judge Lightfin and uh, Cindy Schwartz from uh, Miami and, and we got together and we started putting this together. And as a peer, we start getting inside the communities and start doing what we're supposed to do, putting our boots to the ground, walking, seeing our uh, participants and walking them through this difficult time when they're trying to recover from, well, uh, understand what their mental illness is. So I enjoy it. I love my job. I love what I do. I love when I see the smile on your face when you ask, when you realize that you too can be normal in your light and going from there. So I just appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. Look forward to hearing more from you. Uh, next on the panel is Patty Tobias, who's a principal court management consultant with the National Center, who's leading the staffing of this task force. Patty? Hi, uh, it's great to see everybody. And I I'm a, a, also a, a longtime NACA member. I, I, they, they mentioned I go back to the 80s. So I'm a, a, many of you, I know many of you, and it's so good to be here. It's been my privilege to work with the National Judicial Task Force and help them develop practical uh, resources for you. And I look forward to hearing more about what practical, what additional resources you would like us to develop. Um, I'm a longtime state court administrator, 21 years almost in Idaho, and I served 13 years in the Missouri courts, both at the trial court and as um, a director of court services. Do we have any Missouri folks here? Raise your hand. Yay, Missouri. All right. Huh? Yeah. Um, and uh, once upon a time, when I was just a mere child, I had the opportunity to serve as a probation officer and a detention um, officer. And um, all of those experiences have really helped me um, identify the um, needed changes that we need to make uh, across our nation. So thank you. And last but not least, we have Scott Block, who's here from the Illinois Administrative Office of the Court. So, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Scott Bach, uh, serving the Illinois Supreme Court in the inaugural role as the statewide behavioral health administrator. And I can attest that uh, being one of five or six of us throughout the country, we have a very colorful job description. Uh, a couple of those primary duties include assisting Director Meese with her work on the National Task Force, but also facilitating our Illinois Mental Health Task Force, which is also a multidisciplinary cross-sector group. A couple of the things that I should mention just for some context too is uh, along my professional journey started my career as an outreach worker and then the executive director of an agency working directly with individuals that were homeless and that's where I really started to see that undeniable nexus between behavioral health and justice and then en ended up serving as the director of problem solving courts in a circuit court outside of Chicago where was tasked with implementation of drug court, mental health court, domestic violence court and then most recently as the CEO of our local behavioral health authority where I was really the catalyst for a lot of behavioral health and justice programming including behavioral health law enforcement co-response program, CIT training, so on. So hope to, to bring all those experiences here to the panel today. Great. As you can see, we have a really uh, talented and diverse uh, panel that are going to really sort of go through this. So we're just going to hop right in. Um, so the first thing is, I know that the task force has developed a uh, leading change guide for trial court leaders, as well as one for state court leaders. Um, what is the task force recommending to NACM attendees, um, whether they're looking to get started or build capacity in their jurisdiction? Scott, we'll come to you and get your thoughts on that. Well, David, as you and our panel's uh, members know that Illinois has been a primary contributor to the work of the National Task Force, and we've essentially spent the better part of the last year piloting the state court leader guide, and we have really found a lot of lessons that are applicable to trial courts. In my daily work, I speak pretty frequently with trial court administrators, and really three, three points of interest come to mind that I'd like to share with you today, because often court administrators feel pretty overwhelmed with this discussion. And first, I, I talk a little bit about the commitment and the stain, sustained commitment that it takes to really move the dial. And Walter could attest to this that, you know, I often reference the work in Miami and Judge Steve Leifman, and, and that is the culmination of work that's taken place over the course of 15 
15 to 20 years. So uh, we need to realize that uh, any, any movement forward is going to take time. The second piece is that we can't do it alone. We need to engage those stakeholders that also uh, are system leaders. A lot of the change we would like to make is dependent on or reliant on, on outside systems. So we need to build those relationships in, and work with our partners at mental health authorities, state agencies, and so on. And then the third part is really to harness the court's ability to convene and really embrace that uh, role in the process and, and bringing the right leaders to the table to be able to, to influence change. So really it's that commit, collaborate, and, and convene. Yeah, I think it's really important for all of you in this room who might be thinking, well, mental health, it's, you know, that's what the behavioral health uh, folks are supposed to be focused on. And, and as, as we've talked about already, this already, and you probably already know, of course, this is such a huge issue for us. And so the Leading Change Guide is a really helpful, practical resource that I certainly would urge you all to look at. The links are in the presentation that you should be able to get access to and on the National Mental Health Task Force's website. But as you know, many times uh, the courts can play that convening and leadership role as, as Scott was talking about. Um, the task force has also been really trying to thinking, think about how to rethink case flow management. Um, and as you know, this has been, of course, an important topic for many years, but we've not always focused on really how to, how to do that in this context. So the task force has been really looking at a collaborative person-centered approach to criminal court case management. So when we're thinking about that, what does that mean as a practical matter, um, Justice Goff, from, from your perspective, and what can, what can our attendees do to get started with sort of thinking through how to really do case flow management with this uh, community? Yeah, sure, thank you, David. Um, well, you know, folks that uh, present in court and, and, and who are living with mental illness um, are, are folks that most of us recognize, and oftentimes they're uh, kind of repeat uh, folks that come in uh, with, with some regularity, but uh, when you're em employing uh, a collaborative approach, it's important to have sort of a sustained uh, collaboration, sort of a, a working relationship with the other folks in your, your community, the other folks in your justice system who are going to touch uh, these folks as they work through the process. Um, in Indiana, we rely really pretty heavily on problem-solving courts. We've got approaching 130 problem-solving courts. So in my experience, creating a drug court uh, in our community was very helpful when, when we uh, saw somebody who would come in with, with this sort of a need uh, because I could, uh, without violating the code of judicial conduct, have a conversation with my county sheriff uh, at uh, our regular problem solving court meeting, or I could have a conversation on a regular basis with a probation officer. And these folks in turn would have uh, relationships, working day-to-day -day relationships with other people who might be able to connect uh, these folks with resources in our community or identify gaps in our community that they could reach out and, and, and maybe uh, at the state level connect these folks with uh, some placement, some medication assistance, you, you, know, you name it, uh, that you don't encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's just not something that you do uh, when you're, you're handling your regular divorce docket or your regular misdemeanor docket. So really spending some time thinking about how you can work in collaboration with other folks who are critical stakeholders in your local system is an important first step. And we're gonna share with you today uh, some of the resources that have been kind of archived on, on a regular basis on the uh, National Center's website that can help you get started. Patty, I know you've been working on case flow management for a long time. <laughs> And I know you and I have had conversations about um, case flow management. Sometimes the, the principles and practices have to be modified a little bit. What, what has the task force learned with regard to that? So uh, what's been interesting is that the task force has taken the approach that we need to start before the case is filed. You know, typically as a court administrator, you know, I don't worry about, I didn't worry about it until a case was filed with us. The task force has taken a different approach. The task force thinks that there's a lot that can be done in the community uh, before a case is filed, there are alternatives. If we have a different crisis response system, and I know we'll talk uh, more about uh, the implementation of 988, but that's gonna give us, for the first time, an opportunity to respond in a medical way to a, a psychiatric crisis rather than to a criminal justice 
uh, way. So if we can work in our communities ahead of time, if prosecutors, um, they have alternatives and they're looking at different approaches to uh, determining whether a charge should be filed or alternatively, are there other solutions in the community connecting individuals to um, uh, treatment and behavioral health support services, et cetera. So there's a lot of focus on the pre-filing area that I think all of you and all of us can do a better job of. And then if a case is filed and if uh, an individual has behavioral health condition, are there options there? Is the judge getting that information? Is a screen being done in jail? Is that information going to the judge? So that immediate early, early, like first appearance, <laughs> triage of that case to see if there are different pathways. So that early intervention is a, another key element. Um, sharing the information is another uh, facet that needs to be examined, and then having alternate pathways, having diversion to treatment pathways, depending upon the criminogenic risk and needs, and on and on. So take a look at this because it introduces uh, many new ideas that are in place in individual uh, courts, but this puts everything together. So again, take a look. This is really a fascinating area that we can do much better in looking at civil alternatives too. So I have a question for all of you, um, which is how many of you by a show of hands would say that in your jurisdiction you have a problem with the wait list on competency to stand trial evaluations or restoration? Yeah, a lot of the room. This is one of the most urgent problems that the task force has identified is how to try to eliminate or reduce that, that weight uh, to have competency to stand trial evaluations and restoration. So, Walter, I'm going to come to you because I know you've done some innovative things in the, the circuit uh, to really think about how to divert cases from the competency system and other steps that, that the task force identified that the, the audience could look at and take. Yes, uh, like I said, it's, I'm at uh, Miami uh, Mental Health Project. And for one thing, it is, it's about this relationship. Uh, I said earlier concerning about uh, the changes. That's one thing that we also want to change, that we want to divert people away. If we had a way that we don't have to put you in court that you can go through charges, then is we can divert you from it, then we'll be glad to do it. But one thing that we do lead from is that when we, one thing we hate is you got to get arrested for this great program to work. And that's what we're trying to stop. We don't, we don't just want to arrest people and put people back in jail and all of a sudden just start adding to that big number of people uh, with mental illness inside jail. But what we do is we have the psychiatrists and we have our nurses and everything there at the jail. So if you so happen to get arrested in Miami, when they're gonna ask you these questions when you get to our jails, do you have any type of mental illness problem? And that's when we're gonna put you aside to a other, another area. We're gonna check for your medication. We're gonna check for your records. And keep in mind is this starts the flow of what we're now doing when we start helping you with your mental illness. And by that time is we now have the paperwork, we have everything lined up and you would now go to one of our specialty courts. That's if at the jail you say that you have a problem. So you would go to our specialty courts and you'll be assigned one of our judges, one of our, our public defenders, one of our state attorneys. This is how all of us is working together. And we'll look at what's going on with you and we'll look at them charges before you get filed that way before you get put in the system. And once we get you accepted, that's when we do that little handoff. You'll have your own court specialist that'll be working with you. You'll have your own peer specialist. So what we will start doing is we'll start looking for outside help because it just don't go in jail. It helps in the community because that's where you come from. You come from that community. You didn't come from the jail. You came from the community there. So we get back with the community and we see who is there, what provider we have for you, who, what facility that you can get treatment on. Then we match you up. Uh, we match you up. They call it that warm handoff, but it's a long handoff. Mm -hmm. And we match you up with a peer that's there for you. And that's one thing that we start looking at. And they're starting to look uh, even around the country at 
what are you going to have outside there? What peer can you have there? Because I, as I was going through a lot of these conferences, I seen that a lot of people didn't have peers and men just life. And we always talk about that, how we got to get more peer involvement. So we get somebody there with you and they go to the treatment center with you. They go to the doctor with you. They do the whole nine yards with you to make sure that you uh, you have someone right beside you and going through your mental uh, going through your mental illness. And by that, that is, we bring you there. You go to the treatment, you're doing your medication, we're helping you live another life. And now when we go to the court, instead of treating that crime there, we start treating the illness. And when you start treating the illness and you start putting them with the area they see it in and they start being more productive inside the area, now you start having more productive citizens. Now you start seeing that you don't see those arrests too much no more. You all of a sudden the phone calls come more. You're gonna get them late at night, you're gonna get them that way, but that's what a peer is supposed to do. Uh, Monday through Saturdays, not for me, you can't call me on Sundays because I go to church. But uh, <laughs> this is what we do and, and you go on from there and we just make that work. Uh, being, that, being there for them for any participant. Let, let, Walter, real fast, just a quick question to you. I, I assume most people know what a peer support specialist is. Um, and I know that um, you just described some of the things they do, uh, but maybe not everyone has, uh, we, we know the research is showing that peer support specialists have a tremendous impact on the success for individuals that were attempting to try to recover. Uh, I'm curious, you just maybe really briefly, any recommendations you would have for people on how to engage peers in the community that could be uh, partners to the court um, in helping individuals? How, how, how would it be the best way to start? Well, a peer is a, is a person with lived experience. And most likely you have a peer that's going to be coming in with a, that had a mental illness or, or, or engaging in a mental illness or some type of substance abuse or something going on with you. So, if I got lived experience, I, can, I tell everybody all the time is, you can ask me anything about the Army because I have that lived experience and I understand it. You can ask me anything about PTSD because I have that lived experience and I'm, go I'm gonna use that. So you get those type of people there to come there to be passionate about it. And when you have that lived experience and you showing somebody else and they see you, that you are the one, that how you went through it and they can do also, they going from there. Matter of fact, that is one of the reasons why I work for uh, the company I work for, because I had the same problem. I had uh, was suffering from mental illness, suffering from PTSD. I was sharing with someone. The Army had my diagnosis is very severe. They said I like to kill people. They said that I shouldn't be in this society. And so they had to work with me. And I seen all these classes. I went through a lot of classes here. I was telling someone last night about wellness recovery action plans. I was telling someone about interactive journaling. And this is the stuff they work with me. And these are simple classes, simple classes. And I looked at it like, wow, you got somebody going for that, but someone helped me. And that's what you get a peer for. You don't get no one just want a job. Your a peer is someone that wants for someone to recover. They want someone to be just like them to recover and be normal. And that's why I took on the role. And that's why when we look for peers, we look for someone who wants to do that and be there and able to interact inside the community and develop that relationship. And once that's going down, you'll start seeing, you'll start seeing more people recover and you'll start seeing less people come into your courtroom because now we can help you more so we don't have, you don't have to go to jail now because you're already being our system so we can continue that help. And it ain't no six months that because you want to get rid of your charges. No, this is a lifetime thing right here. These are the relationships that you build around there and it goes to your peers and it goes all the way back up to your judge. Scott, I know you wanted to add something and then Patty. Great, thank you. Well, a couple points on competence. I mentioned I have a colorful job description. I spend a lot of time working on this space in Illinois. We recently had a judge hold our Department of Human Services in contempt for the delay that it took to transfer individuals from their local jail to state-operated facilities. And, you know, the answer that people don't like to hear is we in Illinois have roughly 1,100 beds and nobody's making any new beds anytime soon. 
So the discussion we're really having, and this is supported now through legislation, is, is reimagining that system. But there is no one size solution to fix this problem. So we are talking about those 1,100 beds that we have are in competition for our misdemeanor, felony offender, civil patients, and NGRI. So, you know, are we really using the resources that we have to their uh, most uh, effective way in that, you know, we should be rethinking, is it really making sense to put a misdemeanor that doesn't pose any public safety threat into one of those beds when they could be deflected into outpatient services? We've started to develop new outpatient fitness restoration programs throughout the state. And uh, if we want to get really radical, even thinking about dismissing low-level misdemeanor cases and, and with a treatment plan in place. So there are a number of solutions that are, are practical in this area. Patty, and then I think Justice Goff has something as well. Great. You can tell that this is the... Yeah, get everybody, get, this is the topic that gets everyone uh, excited <laughs> yeah, up here. Yeah, this is a, the number one task force a recommendation and report. The task force developed 10 recommendations that I really commend to you. This is a very complex problem, but these are, these are our brothers, our sisters, our sons, our daughters, our mothers, our fathers that are being warehoused in jails across the nation. It is incumbent upon all of us to look for these solutions. It's gonna require national, state by state, community by community. It's gonna take all of us uh, getting started to really commit to uh, fix this through uh, collaboration. Um, I want to also mention uh, Walter's, um, the, the diversion. Um, there's many efforts that have to, we got to slow the flow <laughs> into the competency system. Uh, David in Texas had a eliminate the weight campaign, uh, but we have to uh, begin uh, serious work on this prod on this uh, really crisis. I also wanted to mention, in addition to this uh, leading reform and the 10 recommendations, uh, the task force also developed a number of recommendations on peer support. We all need all of our courts. Uh, we, the task force recommended that we examine and hire peer support specialists in all of our operations. We see them uh, like Walter in the, in the felony criminal area, but we also see them in the child welfare area. There are so many ways to incorporate peers into our daily court operations that will uh, assist uh, moving forward in this area. Justice Scott, we're going to give you the last word on competency here. Well, thank you, David. And I, you know, first, I agree with everything that's been said, but something I think might be of particular interest to the audience, um, if I was still in my, my trial court days, I would really be interested in the fact that um, Patty and I got to be part of uh, a convening last week that was um, designated with trying to develop um, a strategy to, to confront this nationwide crisis concerning competency to stand trial. And that convening consisted of leaders, uh, from prosecutors, from the public defense community, uh, certainly from treatment, uh, and to a person, to a group, uh, everyone in attendance agreed with the 10 recommendations that are in this guide. And so my, my initial point, what I, I wanted to say is why I think that's important, especially if you are responsible for a local court system, is many of these recommendations are things that you can do right now. They're things that you can do in your community, regardless of whether or not uh, that happens at the, at, at the state level. But what I, I hope is encouraging to you is every chief justice is being told to develop a way with their state level stakeholders to implement these strategies at the state level. Uh, and part of that implementation strategy is giving every trial court judge uh, that local, that trial court uh, leading change guide. So this is something that may not be obvious uh, at, at, at the front end, but what I think you'll find uh, over the coming uh, couple of years is that this is something that's really taking traction. It's something that people are being told on many different fronts. And that will help you as you try to tackle this issue in your local jurisdiction. So thank you, David. Great, yes, um, all good discussion here. So one of the things that we know, as I mentioned earlier, is that serious emotional disturbances and serious mental illnesses impact all dockets. So Scott, I'm just curious, your recommendations for the audience about what they should do 
for civil ordered, civil court ordered treatment, domestic relations, juvenile justice, child welfare, even traffic dockets. How, how can they take these principles that the task force is looking at and really begin to implement those in all court dockets? Sure. And I don't know that my response would alter too far from my original comments about the application of the leading change guides with committing, convening, collaborating, in that, you know, there's some very practical solutions, obviously, to train our court staff, our judges in, in identification of signs and symptoms and how to be able to maybe intervene within the courtroom setting. But again, most of those systems that you've referenced, again, are really reliant upon outside partners that uh, are, are tasked with implementation of the services involved with treating these individuals. So you need to get all the players to the table and really start to develop local strategies and priorities that uh, can operate within the constraints of your local systems, cultures, and resources. Yeah, and I think the key is don't forget about some of those dockets. Um, really beginning to look through all every docket that you have to really see how you could apply these principles. Patty? Yeah, I was going to uh, mention, uh, so if you handle juvenile cases or work in the juvenile court, there's uh, juvenile mental health diversion guidelines. It's an excellent document. It with It bringing in practices and, and uh, evidence-based practices in all uh, aspects of it. If you work in the child welfare area, I hope you had a chance to learn more about the upstream model uh, that's um, available to you. So look into that if you're in that child welfare area. If you, hear if you work with domestic relation dockets, they just published a wonderful well-being series of what staff and judges can do to ensure the well-being of litigants in front of them. So no matter what, what type of docket, uh, there are recommendations and resources that will help get you started. Walter? Yeah, one thing it is, as I was looking at it, that even though we're jail diversion, we're now in the development of program down uh, in Miami that we're working with the hospitals now. Uh, even though I say that I hate when a person has to get arrested for it. We finally uh, have a program now that the, the hospitals now can tell us and can help spot these people before us, before they go to jail or do anything. By coming in, always coming in the hospital. So now we got peers in there, part of the team, peers and case managers and court specialists that are actually in the, in the hospitals now that are locating that, saying you in three, in, Three months, six months, you're coming back and forth inside the behavior site there. So now we can offer you the same thing that we offer you while if you had got arrested. And that's one thing that we've been looking for for the longest because I always tell them what, why, why people have to get arrested to get this good treatment. So we're coming back now, we're looking at, okay, we see you coming through the hospital, we locate you, and we start giving you the same support. When you start all of a sudden now, you don't have, you was homeless. Now we find you an individual living uh, uh, space where you can live. Right now, if you can't pay for it, we'll pay for it. As we start getting you to the treatments, then we start checking on your disabilities or whatever is something going on with you. And we put all that together. So instead of, now we definitely divert you from court. That's where the true diversion is coming from now. That we are now able to do that. Now we have a hospital that just like, and I think his dream is starting to actually come alive. That, um, I mean, he, he's great at what he does. Somebody don't gave him all this money and he got, we got this a 10 story building there that we got the beds for you, got everything for you. Cause we're trying to divert everything away from the court. We're trying to not to get you there because a lot of people suffer from mental illness. Remember all this volunteering. So you can go there and say, I just want to get out of jail. And you accept this charge and now you, are, you have a felony record, you have a misdemeanor, you have some of your records. We don't need that. We need the treatment for mental illness. And so that's what we're doing. So we're now tapping in the hospital, hospitals and now we're coming up with our own building for we can start diverting people truly away from the court system and into the system that they need to get themselves help for. Justice Goff? Yeah, you know, uh, the, the thing I, th I thought maybe was important to add to the conversation was um, 
there's a strategy that uh, we're encouraging folks to employ as you have these conversations. And um, if you look at the leading change guide, it really impresses upon uh, trial judges the importance of having uh, the sequential intercept model utilized and, and applied in your community. Because the thing that's different about this approach is uh, we're really having a coordinated effort among our states to look at your state system and then at the same time to encourage all your local jurisdictions to look at your system the same way. So, for example, in Indiana, after um, the, the team that we sent to our summit, which was a Deadwood, uh, South Dakota, we um, got some technical assistance to have our, our mental health delivery system looked at. Uh, turns out in Indiana, we've got plenty of beds, but we don't have enough evaluators, so that was mucking up our system. But uh, by having your communities go through this exercise of the sequential intercept model, particularly if you've got all of the necessary players at the table at the same time, and it could be folks that populate or, or, or staff your drug court, or just a, another group that just is regularly convened, they're going to have important input about what they do in their day-to-day -day job when uh, folks like this present in their offices. And by having that conversation uh, at the same time, uh, across the state, you can really uh, begin to have an understanding of where the gaps are and, and where it needs to, they need to be filled and where the resources need to be surged. And you can have folks uh, strategizing in a way that, that's really going to move the needle in this area. So I would encourage everyone to look at that and have uh, a, a serious discussion about how to employ the sequential intercept model to look at how you know, mental health services are, uh, are deployed in your community. So thank you. And I don't, I just want to reiterate one more time because I think it's worth, uh, or at least I feel very passionate about it, which is not to forget about those courts where you might see people the first time. Because the, you know, the, the, the goal is to not let them get further into the system. And so maybe that's your court where loitering offenses go. Or, um, I mean, Texas has like a peeing on the sidewalk offense. I mean, it's like these ridiculous offenses that, and that's why we get people in the system and trying to figure out how to get those individuals who come in that way resources early on so they don't get further into the system is really important. Or in your juvenile court system where you see children coming in early where the early onset, I mean, what we know, the research says is by age 14, many times individuals who have serious mental illness, that's when their first onset was. Let's catch it there. That way we're not dealing with individuals who've been struggling for 10, 15 years and having committed offense after offense after offense before we decide to do something about it. So I'll get off my soapbox there a little bit, but it's important for us to really think about the sequential intercept model and trying to figure out how to intervene as early as possible, getting the community to intervene as early as possible, but also the courts. So obviously the last two years have been a very difficult time for all of us. Um, and the jobs that we do um, are very stressful and lots of challenges. And then add on top of it, the pandemic that all of America and the world have struggled with over the last year, it's certainly uh, highlighted the, the concern about in, uh, mental health and well-being of judges and court employees. So the task force has looked at that. And so Justice Goff, what, why is this important and what can our attendees do about it? Well, uh, you know, it's important because um, we're not immune, right? I mean, I was sharing with my colleagues up here at the table. When I was on the trial bench, I spent years and years, uh, oftentimes in treatment, but uh, in community with folks to try and make our system a healthy system. And, uh, you know, over the last five years, in, in my experience, the last two or three years on a court of last resort, I kind of have to look around and say, geez, what happened? Why am I so uh, stressed? Why am I so uh, frazzled? And so, you know, I think it's important to recognize what uh, seeing and witnessing trauma every day does to our court employees. I think it's important to understand that our court employees are being asked to do terribly difficult work under unprecedented uh, conditions. And then, oh, by the way, you're going to get a whole bunch of other really fun uh, issues thrown back at you to deal with now. So um, I, I think it's really, really important for folks to have a discussion about how to support themselves, but also how to uh, support the employees that are, um, that, that are uh, in, in their local courts. 
So in, in Indiana, we uh, had the opportunity to take part in an early exercise with an organization called One Mind at Work. And uh, they came in and, and really did an assessment to try and meet us where we were at and give us some ideas and perspective about how we might better support our employees. I'd be happy to talk with you more about that, but uh, that also is a resource that is, is available to you all. It, it's free. This assessment is free. But uh, some, some basic ideas and pointers that, that we would suggest to you is, you know, be open and transparent as a leader. Uh, you know, it, it, not only say it's, it's, it's okay to not be okay, but say, yeah, I'm not okay either uh, sometimes. And, and here's what I'm doing about it so that they know it's truly, this is a safe environment. We need to uh, practice self-care so that we can meet our uh, obligations to offer a, a peaceful resolution of conflict for folks at a time when they really need it. Uh, but two, um, you know, I, I always go back to my experience. I, I, I like my drug court not because of, uh, and I liked it because of this too, because of what it did for the folks that were in it, but because of what it did for the folks who staffed it. It was an opportunity for us to come together on a weekly basis, talk about issues that were critical in our community, talk about things that were important to us and what we could do to really uh, affect change in a positive way. Uh, and in a way that, that was relevant, that, that mattered to our community, instead of something that was just kind of being pushed in from, uh, from cable news. And so that's important. Have one of those uh, conversations in your community and have it on a recurring basis. And then the third thing is, uh, really think about designating some folks to spend some time looking at One Mind at Work and uh, gathering up that, that, that information. Uh, be familiar with your uh, lawyer assistance program or your employee assistance program so that when folks do present with a need, you can make sure that they, uh, they know where to get help. Excellent. Um, did you have something? Yeah, Scott. yeah, if I may. Um, and I probably don't need to remind everyone in this room that uh, as adults we spend essentially one third of our lives at work. So it's important to make that a uh, meaningful and healthy experience. But you know, for those that like statistics and, and the financial aspect of this as well, it's well researched that absenteeism and presenteeism have you know extreme impact on, on productivity and, and financial impacts. But Illinois has also been able to jump on to the One Mind at Work initiative. And you know, my message would be not to overcomplicate this. It's it's a way that uh, we've started to really just to foster and develop a, a culture of health and wellness. And some of the tips and resources that we'll be providing to our staff include uh, an opportunity for a monthly wellness hour where we'll, we'll have a guided discussion or topical speaker and even reminders about things like healthy eating, sleeping patterns, all these kind of things are important and they're things we tend to forget about as we're you know engrossed in our daily lives. So I think it's a, you know an opportunity for leadership really to engage staff and just start to foster that culture of wellness. Yeah. All right, let's uh, move on here. Um, so the all the things that we've been talking about today um, are on the Mental Health Task Force's website, which um, you have access to here. Uh, but Patty, just you know, you've been staffing this uh, along with uh, Michelle O'Brien, who's sitting over here, and many others. Um, what, do you, what would you say are some of your favorite tools, best practices, and resources that you want to make sure the attendees here don't miss out on, and how can they go about accessing them? So I, uh, the four that are listed there, the behavioral health and the state court website, you got to go out there. It doesn't take long. NCSC.org backslash behavioral health. Get out there, tool around, see, you know, depending upon what area, what docket, what responsibilities you have, there is something there for you. And in addition, there's still a lot of stuff in the pipeline. And then in about one more minute, we want to hear from you and write down on your cards what's going to be most helpful to you. I also want you to take a look at what's called the Behavioral Health Resources Hub. We've set it up for uh, criminal cases along the sequential intercept mapping model. Of all the resources in for each of those intercepts that we want to bring to your attention. So if you decide this is an area that you want to focus in, there are uh, again, masterful list of, of resources for you. We've also been collecting your resources from states and communities. So there are articles out there, there are tools that you all have 
developed. Um, so take a look at the state resources. And then my favorite, you have to sign up or email me, are the twice a month behavioral health alerts. We curate everything that's going on that we hear about, all the research, all the new innovations that courts have been developing, all of the uh, resources that the task force adopts. So uh, again, it's twice a month. You can sign up um, on that link or just email me and I'll sign you up. But it's twice a month. You got to sign up and, and uh, take a look at it. I see some head shaking. For those of you who already receive it, uh, again, it, it, it it's such a valuable resource to stay abreast of everything that's happening. All right. We're going to now turn to you because we want you to participate in this. So we're going to spend about the next 10 minutes. Um, what we would like you to do at, at your table, there are some pieces of paper we would like to, for you as a group and individually to talk about um, one of three things, or you can talk about a mixture of them. But one of the biggest challenges you're facing in your jurisdiction, what solutions has your jurisdiction come up with or are you working on? What resources do you have or what challenges with resources do you have? So we want to give you a couple of minutes and then we're going to, I'm going to call you back to order in about 10 minutes and then Patty and I are going to kind of come around the room and hear, uh, let you share some of the things that you're doing. So I'll give you a, a few minutes and I'll call you back in a minute. If you could amongst yourselves at your tables talk about uh, what is it you're doing and hopefully those of you watching online can do the same. Okay. <clears throat> If we can have your attention again, I hear lots of great conversation, but we're going to hopefully share what you've come up with the rest of the room. So um, if we can have your attention, that'd be great. Uh, and I'll just point out there's a lot of good interactive discussion going on on the uh, conference app for those of you that are live streaming. So I appreciate that. We're capturing that. So that'll be helpful. Okay. So... The first thing we, uh, I know we could probably spend the rest of the day talking about this, but uh, Patty and I are going to come around the room. We're curious, um, what did you come up with with challenges? What challenges are you facing um, that you um, would like to talk about? So anyone want to volunteer, raise your hand. We're going to come out in the audience and hand the mic to you. So what challenges are you facing? David, you mentioned uh, the deinstitutionalization issue that came up back in the 60s and the move towards community mental health. One of the challenges we discussed was the fact that since that has happened, a lot of the community mental health agencies are not properly resourced or adequately resourced. Um, there are a lot of good-meaning people, a lot of talented folks, but they often don't have what they need um, to be able to meet the demand that's out there. Uh, and oftentimes there's a pecking order. You have to have some kind of serious and persistent mental illness before you can get services. So a lot of the folks that we're, we've been talking about that are trying to come in on you know, lower level charges or things like that can't access what they need. So that's a, a huge challenge that we're recognizing. Uh, how many of you would say you have similar issues with that, with resources? I'm assuming that's probably most everybody in the country. So uh, certainly something worth engaging with community health about. Um, and I, I would also mention on that issue, there has been a, a lot of money coming. It's not made it down to the community level. But uh, pay attention to uh, certified community behavioral health clinics. The feds have been putting a lot of money coming that way. But again, it hasn't always reached all of us yet. But uh, again, I've seen a lot of money flowing. The most recent uh, gun legislation has a lot of mental health treatment money. But again, it's kind of, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time to get down to each and every community. And of course, you know, we have a, a workforce shortage. Just as we're having um, challenges in the courts, they're having challenges with the behavioral health workforce. But keep a, keep an eye on the federal funding coming through. There's also, we've been doing some work with the uh, SAMHSA and uh, the state block grant funds, and there's going to be guidance for the state behavioral health authorities to be working more closely with the courts. So again, more to keep uh, abreast of. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about solutions. This is something we'd love to hear from you all. 
what at your table, what solutions have you, are you uh, either doing or looking at doing? Um, we have a hand back here. I'm going to get my, uh, a few steps in here. Hi, um, we came up with, we were, um, would like a representative from the mental health department or behavioral services to be present at each courthouse. We'd also like for training for our employees and management team so that this way we can deal with the mental health uh, customers that come in. Great, good solution. Uh, what about any other solutions? Surely you all in this room, brilliant people. All right, thank you. Kelly. Uh, one thing that we talked about was trying to find ways where you can centralize these defendants on dockets that isn't necessarily problem-solving courts. So one of the things we struggle with in problem-solving courts is that it's voluntary and there are a lot of restrictions around who can come in. And oftentimes you can't take somebody who um, has competency pending and there's some other restrictions. But if you identify them through screening at the jail. Um, you can arraign them together based on a flag. You can pretrial them together. You can status them together so that when you have your resources come from state hospital or community behavioral health, they're all coming to one docket. Like one of the things we struggle with, we have 69 judges, is that if they all happen to have somebody <laughs> who has a mental health issue on their docket, I can't get the representatives to just run around our three courthouses all day to try to provide information and resources. So to try to take what we think works well in the way cases or statuses in problem solving courts and try to apply it to our caseload generally. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, you're exactly right. And there are sections about uh, recommending specialized dockets, specialized behavioral health dockets. Those are part of the alternate pathways. Um, it that, and that are mentioned in that collaborative case flow. So yeah, take a look at that, all of you. Let's hear what LA's doing. We actually have a dedicated mental health courthouse with dedicated mental health judges and the competency cases as well as cases from um, probate and other areas go to that court and we have doctors on site that when they're brought in do the evaluations and can give them to the judges while they're there and then they can identify what services they need to be linked to. And we found that to be incredibly efficient both for the county as well as for the court. The courthouse was designed to be a mental health courthouse and it even has an area where a, where an ambulance can come up if someone is actually strapped down to have their hearings where the judge and the staff will go outside to conduct whatever hearing they need. So it's a really good model. It's a, an expensive model so the county really has to be committed to do their part as well as the court but we found that to be a really good model. David, I have one over, a solution over here. Well, first, um, I don't know if I'm the only one here from North Dakota, but um, we're working on uh, a number of things. I want to put in a plug for the technical support services from Patty and, and Michelle. Uh, that's been invaluable to us in North Dakota. We've uh, stood up a mental health task force and are working on a few things, but amongst those things, legislation on competency restoration and diverting misdemeanors. So that's a couple of priorities for us. Anyone talk about resources, either the, I know we had a little bit of talk about that earlier, need for or how you've been able to obtain resources? What can we help you with? Yes. So for better or worse, our county leveraged ARPA funds in conjunction with the local mental health authority to, to create a law enforcement 24-hour law enforcement drop-off site because what we found is that people are on one of two ends of the spectrum normally. Either they qualify for admission to a mental health facility or they qualify for admission to jail and the police don't want to not do one or the other and if the person doesn't qualify for mental health facility, we can't make them take them. Uh, and so they end up with the latter solution. So what we did was took the ARPA funds, used that to support the LMHA who created this facility where law enforcement have that option C. Uh, it only opened a month or so ago, so we don't quite yet know how effective it is, but that's 
one possibility, but I will say at this table and, and to my colleague from Georgia, I think the resource need is show us the money to steal from Jerry Maguire, um, because that's that's really the only the only solution that we have right now. Patty, Can I'll give you an opportunity to make a concluding remark. Oh my. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess my advice would be, my hope would be that you will just get started. Um, if you haven't uh, really begun work in this area, just get started. Take a look at one area. Convene a group in your community. Listen to what's going on. Take a look at the data. Just get started. Um, my second piece of advice would be to sign up for the behavioral health alerts. Um, again, you can either email me or sign up on the website. My third piece of advice would be just call us. Um, we want to help. We want to fix these problems and it will do anything to share uh, the wealth of resources that have been developed. We're passionate. We're committed. We want to help you. Great. Um, one thing I'll just add to this, uh, to Patty's uh, comments, is that uh, this is a huge priority, of course, for the National Mental Health Task Force, but it's also a huge priority for the National Center for State Courts. So as Patty just mentioned, and as um, was mentioned from the, our North Dakota colleague, um, you know, if there's something that we can do to help you, certainly please reach out. There is funding available to support efforts at the federal level and other places. So uh, Patty and Michelle and others uh, at the National Center um, can help you with linking with some of those. Um, so if you need technical assistance or consulting, or you just don't even know where to get started, you just need to, somebody to bounce an idea off of, uh, we certainly hope that you'll reach out. Um, and we would love to hear what you're doing um, because it's important for us to, to share that information with your colleagues around the country. So if you have something you're doing, please um, reach out to Patty. Um, it's easy to know, ptobias at ncsc.org, uh, the traditional National Center email address. Um, please reach out to her and let her know. And then lastly, um, we are hoping uh, to begin to get some funding to do some pilots to implement the National Task Force's recommendations. So we're going to be looking for pilot sites, and probably many of you are in this room, so I hope you'll consider doing that. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you being here and look forward to having more conversations in the future.